Hello, everyone. Um, we are about to get started. Thank you for your patience. Um, we are just going to let uh, a few folks come in um, so we can uh, just, you know, I just open up the webinar. Um, and we appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, I do have one quick uh, program note. Um, we did plan to stream this on Facebook this evening, um, but we are having some technical difficulties with that. So what we will do is, um, you know, and this is for anybody who's going to see this on Facebook, uh, we will post this recording on Facebook, um, you know, as soon as, you know, as soon as we're done, probably, you know, within the next 24 hours. So um, appreciate you joining us. Um, we'll just give it a couple more seconds, see if anyone else joins. Um, it's okay. Um, Hi, everyone. My name is John Nelson. I'm the AVP of Community Government and Public Relations for New Vance Health, and I am um, thrilled that you would, could join us tonight for tonight's uh, uh, Norwalk Hospital Community Forum. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to Peter Cordeaux, the president of uh, Norwalk Hospital, to uh, take you through this evening's program. Thank you so much, and it's off to you, Peter. Thank you very much, John. It's my pleasure. Um twice a year to provide a community report on the status of Norwalk Hospital and New Vance Health. So if we can go to the agenda, uh, John, you know, plan to talk about hospital updates and really everything in that section about what's going on um, at Norwalk Hospital, then some affiliation updates, and then I will turn it over to um, Rowena Bergman's about a community health needs assessment and a community health um, plan, and then turn it over to PYA and Dwight to discuss um, their reviews of Norwalk Hospital in the system. Next slide, John. So time for a checkup. Um, don't put your health on hold. So for us here at the hospital, we want to make sure that We've uh, certainly providing access to patients, um, including with our visitors, right? So it's very important for our visitors or for our patients to have visitors to assist in their health care. As we deploy our care partners program, we want to make sure that at least two support persons are available to visit uh, patients up to nine hours a day. And so as uh, much of the nation is, we're opening up more, uh, you know, year three post covid and being able to provide those services with our enhanced uh, patient safety measures. From an outpatient perspective, we're enhancing our direct book. So for the patient's convenience on their time, they can schedule their appointment that meets their needs. So that's very important. And we also continue to le leverage telehealth when appropriate, especially in behavioral health. And another piece that I will add in telehealth is that there are many telehealth services that we leverage out of the emergency department too, including behavioral health and neurology for stroke care. So it is not just in the outpatient setting, we do use it in the acute setting very successfully uh, in those two aforementioned uh, services. Next slide, John. So awards and recognition. Uh, Norwalk Hospital, um, is a proud award winner of the 2022 Mission Lifeline Gold STEMI Receiving Hospital. And that STEMI refers to ST Elevation MI. These are people that are having a large, massive heart attack due to occlusion. And we as a receiving hospital who've been doing this for well over a decade provide high level gold services. So, you know, time is muscle in the cardiac world. So to be able to assess a patient in the field, determine and transmit that EKG across, initiate the processes by which we're ready to receive that patient to receive life-saving care at Norwalk Hospital. Uh, the same applies to stroke. So for stroke, similar protocol, in the stroke, what's different is um, we actually grab that clot and pull it out of the brain um, to, again, save brain tissue. So being uh, gold plus in stroke and being gold in STEMI receiving is huge because it's huge for the community to understand that not only are we American Heart Association accredited, we are Joint Commission accredited in these areas. 
And I really think, you know, as, as folks from, I'm sure the Office of Health Strategy will review this, and our partners from PYA, there are some protocols that really need to be, you know, moved up to date. Uh, looking at stroke, for instance, our ability to do that care doesn't require a CON. To do some of the elective procedures on the cardiac side, I think we're decades behind in terms of what needs to be delivered in the community and what is considered to be standard of care. So I do think these sessions are, are good to start to think of what, what is standard of care in the community and what should community's expectations be for services at their community hospital. Next slide, John, please. So high quality recognized care. So I am proud to say, and for those of you who don't know me or don't recall, I am a registered nurse um, by training. Um, very proud to say that again, for our second year in the role of row, uh, Norwalk Hospital is the top 100 hospital in the country. This doesn't happen by accident. Um, we are recognized that puts us in the top 2% of all acute care hospitals. And the next slide will show you why. We are recognized uh, two years in a row for best in critical care, three years in a row in best in stroke, GI in 23, neurosciences 22, 23, pulmonary care 22, 23. These, these are things and you know, they, they just happen to dovetail into a lot of our great programs, whether that be a pulmonary fellowship, our neurology residency program that's starting out of New York or started out of New York um, and just got accolades from the ACGME, our GI fellowship program, pulmonary fellowship. These are things that Norwalk has that is pretty unique and special for a uh, we're, we're not the big, we're not the big engine, we're the little engine that could. So we're the community hospital that acts like a academic teaching medical center. And this is phenomenal um, recognition for our hospital. I couldn't be more proud. And in our spare time, next slide, John. In our spare time, uh, our CNO, uh, Leslie Lincoln, we, you know, when we look at workforce development and our staffing crises, we know that we have to train our own nurses. And not only are we training our own nurses, Leslie and the ED team got the uh, emergency rooms nurse residency program accredited by the American Nursing Credentialing Center. Also, Norwalk Hospital has started the very first PA surgical residency program in the country in the 70s. Um, I will biasly say the best PA surgical residency program in the country and that program just got accredited and we do that in conjunction with Yale and I have the luxury of in, you know, uh, escorting out the new graduates and bringing in the new class annually. It is second to none and these are programs again, programs again, right at Norwalk Hospital, right in your backyard to provide these services for you. So next slide, if we look moving forward, next slide. Um, I talked about a lot of education, a lot of great things. So as we grow, uh, Dr. John Murphy, the CEO of New Vance Health, thought it was very important to bring on a chief academic officer. Dr. Derek DeLeon joined, uh, joined us uh, a little while ago and has a ton of experience in this area. And Dr. DeLeon's looking at this, not only from the obvious, whether that be med schools, nursing schools, residency programs, but all the way down into the community and workforce development. What can we do? Also in relation to some of the research that there's so much that New Vance Health does that we we don't even get, you know, even we don't know exactly to what extent the great research and work that's going on behind the scenes, especially in cancer for New Vance Health. So, you know, it is a great pleasure to work with Dr. DeLeon and really think of education beyond just the doctors and looking all the way down to the high school students and what we could do if we're going to really talk about the health of the community, but also the workforce and how do we be that vessel that gets um, high school students interested in medicine and to take out a medical career, especially at a time where there are so many other options, especially post-pandemic. I think this is just vitally important. Next slide. So care close to home. So over the past four years uh, that I've been at Norwalk in January 19th, I believe today was when I started at Norwalk as part of New Vance and have been part of the, 
both legacy systems since since 2013. But we made a very conscious effort to take all of our ambulatory locations and try to create a multiple multi-specialty locations to provide convenience and easy access to care. So Norwalk Radiology and Mammography Center is housed in our iPark uh, office building, the former Perk and Elmer corporate office. We have 108,000 square feet there that has many, many of our medical practices um, there that from OBGYN to all the suite of radiology services to primary care, oncology, breast surgery, you name it, it'll be there soon to have neurology, neurosurgery, physiatry, pain management, and most likely rehab. So again, on a public transportation route to serve all and multi-specialty convenience in one location. Our Norwalk Surgery Center is recent as today, <clears throat> which is housed in our 40 Cross Street building where we just recently signed in the past year master lease, keeping us there at least 15 to 20 years. We will occupy the, the entire 78,000 square feet there and looking at plans to build out our ambulatory surgery center um, to occupy the entire uh, first floor. Cardiology will be there, primary care, endocrine, GI, pulmonary, all of those multi-specialties will be housed at 40 Cross Street. So our ability to provide convenient care, and those sites are only you know, a mile or two apart. Wilton Wellness, as we continue to move farther up, the Route 7 corridor has a massive primary care practice. Metabolic and endocrine, we're looking to move to the second floor ONS orthopedic surgery with PT, also occupies that building, and we will continue to expand in that space. Again, public transportation route, easy access, great parking, and it allows patients to continue to have their care within our network. It's convenience. It reduces the duplication of service, reduces the cost of care, and that is something that's been vitally important by OHS and the reason we have PYA to ensure that we are abiding by uh, what we promised we would do, and these are three shiny examples of that. And John, I'm not sure, yep, the next slide, please. I think this is, this is huge. So this is our brand new Norwalk Behavioral Health at 14 Westport Avenue. So as, as we talked about changing our delivery of care, we also have to change what we, what we consider to be acceptable and the acceptable norm. So we find it acceptable that psychiatrists in the community can take no insurance, only accept cash and leave the most vulnerable out to only utilize an emergency department as their, their means for psychiatry. So when we talk about inpatient beds, we think that a locked unit for someone with behavioral health issues is the only mechanism and the only metric by which we measure behavioral health. And I find that really disturbing. And so for us, we wanted to make sure that in our community, and it doesn't exist till now, in our community that we had intensive outpatient, a uh, dual diagnosis intensive outpatient and adolescent intensive outpatient here in Norwalk that accepts everybody, all comers, regardless of your ability to pay. This was supported by $2.15 million uh, federal earmark supported by Senator Richard Blumenthal, Chris Murphy, and Representative uh, Jim Himes. And we promised we'd do it. We met sweltering hot summer day in there to talk about it. And um, it is open. It is gorgeous. It's 15,000 square feet. And if we need more, there's another 15,000 square feet for us to be able to expand to. So I think we built this out in about six months, if not less, we'll have a ribbon cutting. I think it's the 22nd of February, just as a, a grand opening to celebrate this. But this is the future. This is how to keep people out of the hospital. A hospital inpatient bed is not your answer to behavioral health care. It's meeting these patients in the community where, where they are. And we met and our letters of support have been from the superintendent of schools because these services are needed. Um, the chief of police as they embed social workers in their squad cars and in their police forces and lean on us to help with them 
for what they're what they're seeing in the community. So this to me is just amazing, amazing that we're able to do it and turn it around in such short time. And I think it might be on the next, oh, it's not on the next one, John, but that's okay. You can leave that slide up. That's fine. I will address it. But uh, our other plan in the ED, which I will address in terms of how we're adapting to care and, and what we're doing, um, because the focus, if you haven't noticed so far, is on Norwalk Hospital for New Vance in, in the next few years. So Great story here. Dan DeBarba actually had my role back when Norwalk was an independent hospital and was one of the architects uh, that created with John Murphy, Western Connecticut Health Network. Uh, Dan had moved down in his career and um, for seven years or so, and hooray for us, Dan's back as the CFO of the network. Uh, what does this mean to us? I mean, his knowledge, not only of the network, his knowledge of big, big networks as a CFO and his ability to help us really become into, integrated has been powerful since he came um, late summer, early fall. So it's really been a pleasure to work with Dan and um, I anticipate great things. It's been wonderful working with him. And again, it's so nice to have someone with the institutional knowledge that Dan brings to the table as um, we continue to grow as a a really new organization as of April 1, as I mentioned, will be four years old. So we, if you walk in the uh, main lobby of Norwalk Hospital, I think we do a really nice job in recognizing our staff because, you know, the, the best part about Norwalk Hospital is the culture, the people, and everybody around the hospital. So for anyone who knows Jason Fischel in the ED, he's the bomb. He's great. He's our EMS director. Um, Dr. Barnhard is our neonatologist, and he's really the anchor down there at OB, and everyone has so much confidence in him. And Mary Henry, um, here, excuse me, um, everybody raves about in terms of her contribution to hematology and oncology. We do this um, to also highlight and spotlight some of the areas that you take for granted that, oh yeah, we have great providers who do this, but we do this every month for a reason because um, we have great doctors. It's a great community. We are so fortunate to have such talented people within our organization. It's very nice to highlight just what exceptional clinicians we have. And so we honor them as often as we can. So now to move into our transformation plan. Um, next slide, John. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide only because the, the subsequent slides really get to the meat of all of this. But as you can see, certainly we're investing a heck of a lot in Norwalk Hospital. Um, we're also enhancing the services that we're providing, but we're also adapting. So what we're investing in and what we're enhancing, we also have to adapt to that, that time. So first and foremost, you know, we are embarking on 188,000 square foot new patient pavilion, which is what you see on the left, which will be the Bauer family pavilion. And the Bowers have generously donated $20 million towards this project. We have a $100 million philanthropic goal um, for this project. The Bowers, we also have the Bauer ED and the Jeffrey Peter Bauer NICU. Um, and George just stepped off the board, I believe. George would be 92. Um, in May, and Carol continues to volunteer at the hospital um, as a chaplain where she's been there over 40 plus years at the hospital. So this is a couple that not only gives with their dollars, but their time. The fact that still um, in their 90s, giving the time, donating it to a board, donating and volunteering hours is, is amazing. We were able to celebrate the both of them uh, a few weeks back, and they are so deserving, not only of the recognition, but their commitment to the hospital. And there's nothing more than we would like to see than to have this project finish and have them them cut that ribbon for us. There'd be nothing more special. And the Bowers are actually being awarded 
Uh, in March, in the beginning, they, they just received the New England Philanthropic, Healthcare Philanthropic Award, um, that they are the winners. And so there'll be a lot of representatives from New Vance Health to go up there to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to recognize them for all their great work and for all they do. And it's not just for Norwalk Hospital. It is just about everything you could imagine. So they are a special couple and we are so blessed to have them as part of the Norwalk Hospital family and to consider them friends. So ambulatory care, I did talk about iPark briefly before. So iPark is the is on the top, the 108,000 square foot building that houses all of our radiology. And over the past few years, that's been a little confusing to patients because we're operating, meaning functioning in two different locations. So everything's under one roof now, nice and neat. It's not easy to take this massive MRI and take it out of another building and drive it down the street and hook it up and put in another building that requires walls taken down and cranes and all those, those messy things. And that's all thankfully done. Um, beautiful space and a parking deck and ramp garages being built in that area also. So we will be a staple in that area for decades to come. Wilton Wellness is pretty much brand new. You can't get a better location in a better building there. So we will continue to grow and expand in that space. And that space is a beautiful spot in terms of its proximity between Norwalk and Danbury, which allows us to get a lot of other subspecialists that we may not have a full-time need in Norwalk, but can certainly leverage some of the expertise that's at one of our tertiary care centers, such as Danbury Hospital to have session space there at Wilton Wellness. 40 Cross Streets, where our surgery center is, that bottom floor. Again, another beautiful building that'll be 100% new vans. Bottom floor will be surgery center and all those other subspecialties will be um, filling that space. The first to go in probably by May will be cardiology, then primary care. And then as we, as fast as we can renovate, um, all those other subspecialties will be in there. And the reason why that's so important is <laughs> twofold. One, uh, it's great to get them all under one roof. And the second is we need to vacate the spaces where the buildings are coming down in order to uh, embark on our construction project. So there's it, the, 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 the work in the process to find locations for people, sometimes temporary, um, to relocate, to reestablish, to educate the community on that in order for us to then take down those buildings has been years in the making and a lot of work is going on right now to almost what I'd call surgically disconnect, whether it's electricity, plumbing, data, um, in a way that we can take down that building and not disrupt any of the operations um, at the main hospital. So there's been just a voluminous amount of work that went in there and then, you know, real a testament, a real testament to our uh, construction team. John? And we're adapting, and, and what does that mean? So I started to talk when, when I was mentioning the uh, outpatient behavioral health unit. Um, another part of our proposal is, you know, is, is we've seen in the behavioral health crisis, the reason we're holding behavioral health patients in RED is generally because we can't find a safe discharge disposition. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a lot of times there are people, and we talked to dual diagnosis population, population, these are people that come in under the influence of drugs and alcohol and may, may state that they want to kill themselves. Once, they, once they're sober and once they're seen by a psychiatrist, they may be deemed not a harm to themselves. They didn't mean it. It was because of the, they're under the influence. But if we don't have a safe place to discharge them, whether it's a weekend whether it's the inability to pay for services or find someone to accept them, it keeps patients in the ED. So we need to have rooms that are ligature free, right? A room, and what I mean by that is a room that does not allow patients to be able to take their own life, to hang themselves, to hurt themselves in any way. So these rooms, those plans have been approved by the Department of Public Health. They will be under construction shortly and should only take a few short months to convert uh, many more of our rooms. We already have two, we'll move up to six, I believe, um, in RED. But getting back to the, the slide about our outpatient, now having 
an adult IOP, a dual diagnosis IOP, and an adolescent IOP, remember intensive outpatient services, we have places to refer our patients. And we believe over time, this model is going to result in less people having to access the ED for their behavioral health care. That's the ultimate goal here. The ultimate goal shouldn't be we need more inpatient beds. The ultimate goal should be we need to reduce the dependence of the ER for patients who need behavioral health care. We see this as the solution to that problem. And um, kudos to New Vance Health for recognizing that to our state senators or, you know, state federal senators um, for recognizing that and getting uh, funds for us to embark on this project. Um, in addition to that, we will consolidate inpatient to Danbury, which certainly makes a lot of sense because part of part of the inpatient care isn't just the being inpatient in a locked door. It's the, the therapeutic milieu that you can create and the environment that you create that creates a, a very healthy and vibrant recovery process to allow you to be discharged safely to that next level of care. We don't want two suboptimal units in our area. Um, generally, in the inpatient unit, rule of thumb is you know almost a million dollars a bed. These are very cost prohibitive because of the ligature risk, because of the safety, because of what it takes to build a state of the art unit to provide that level of care. And we believe this is the best as, as capital is is um, scarce across the country, but across our seven hospital network, we want to make sure that we're the best stewards of the money and using it in the right way to provide the best service for our community. And I believe I've been able to articulate to you tonight that there's been a lot of thought in what this behavioral health plan looks like and what it can be and what it will be and how it will uh, make a difference in our community and the communities that we serve. And then lastly, telehealth, as you know, um, comes in very handy for a lot of reasons. Uh, behavioral health is one great avenue. So whether it's group therapy, family care, how do I how do I include a family member in that in that meeting? Well, a family member could be across the globe and participate in that meeting via telehealth. So just like you and I are communicating tonight, there's a great ability to leverage these platforms. I mentioned before that whether it's a neurologist evaluating a stroke patient remotely in the ED and looking at that. CAT scan, whether it's uh, an EKG being transmitted um, to the ED and whether it's a behavioral health, a psychiatrist evaluating patient to assess their risk to themselves to uh, provide a safe discharge and or admit that patient directly from Norwalk Hospital um, to our other inpatient units and all our docs are cross-credentialed Connecticut, New York licenses to give them that flexibility should that need arise. Next slide, Jan. And we're developing our workforce. So this is a really cool story about workforce development. In this picture in the center is the new president of the uh, Connecticut Community College system, similar to the Connecticut University system. The, the community colleges are all under one umbrella. And then Cheryl Devonish uh, that you see, um, Next to me is the president of Norwalk Community College, Cheryl, myself, and um, the uh, superintendent of schools and others are really passionate about workforce development. And we've been working together to not only provide internships and experiences, which I believe we are second to none in the state in terms of not only talking the talk, but walking the walk, creating paid internship programs. And as of hopefully a couple of weeks from now, creating a process by which to get seniors their CNA certificate and provide them with jobs, um, guaranteeing them jobs when they're done with that program. So by doing that, we think we can help create and introduce uh, high school students to, uh, to healthcare, but also, and the folks on the left are from Stanford Hospital, Stanford Hospital, Norwalk Hospital, and the foundation at the community college, we have joint scholarships. So for any RN with an associate's degree that either hospital hires, we will pay 100% their bachelor's degree moving forward. So here's a pipeline where someone from the Norwalk community can become a CNA, have a job, 
Uh, they get to go to the community college for free, uh, be employed by one of the area hospitals, and then have their bachelor's degree paid for. So we see this as a great way for someone who may be undecided, doesn't have the means to have a very, you know, great, outstanding career um, without being saddled with any financial burden and uh, creating a really a great asset and a great pipeline for us to leverage in our community. So we just completed our first year in terms of uh, starting these programs. We started from absolutely nothing, didn't know where it was going to end up super duper popular. And um, we continue to invest in it and continue to um, see great things occurring with loads of wonderful, talented people who give their time to dedicate to high school students who are very interested in um, their futures. And it's really, really heartwarming to see. I think that might be the end of mine, John. And if it is, yes, I'm going to pass it to my friend and colleague, Rowena Bergman's VP of Strategic payer and community partnerships to talk about our community health needs assessment and our community health improvement plan. Rowena. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. And it's it's great to be here this evening. Um, I wanted to review with you um, the community health needs assessment and improvement plan because it really speaks to um, and dovetails very nicely to the um, work that's being done on the inpatient setting, but also much more important what's happening out in the community. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as a reminder, the Community Health Needs Assessment is a requirement of the Affordable Care Act, and uh, nonprofit hospital systems need to conduct a Community Health Needs Assessment and Improvement Plan every three years. And the, the federal government is fairly prescriptive about um, who needs to be involved and what the purpose is for that needs assessment. Um, there has to be demographic assessments of the communities or the hospitals that you're serving. Um, it needs to be perceived health care issues in the community um, from the community members. You need to use both quantitative and qualitative data in order to um, assess your community. And it has to include things that uh, go beyond uh, strict clinical care. You need to have a uh, look at social determinants of health, factors that influence health and well-being, neighborhoods, environment, even economic stability of the residents in your community. And from there, um, you, you really give a, um, a, a holistic picture of the folks that are accessing your services. On the bottom is just an example of our community partners. This is not all inclusive. I, I, I ran out of room on the slide, um, but it gives you a, a clear uh, illustration that we work with everyone from health departments to clinics, to mental health organizations, um, to the Y. So it really is very inclusive. If you want to find our community health needs assessment, I've given the link on the bottom and uh, you'll be able to read a very robust report if you're interested. Next slide, please. So we just completed our community health needs assessment and what did we find? Not surprising that the top issues that our, um, that our community are concerned about really is around chronic diseases, mental health and substance use, access to care and health disparities. Uh, not surprising during COVID, um, all of these conditions were exacerbated, especially for um, certain segments or, or distinct populations. Uh, just to orient you, the slide uh, on the left, the picture on the left, the, the map shows you all of the areas that are part of the Norwalk community and greater community. And one of the things I wanna highlight, and again, um, we know that much of what makes us healthy or sick have really nothing to do with the healthcare that you're receiving in a hospital system, but it's really social drivers of health. Um, the graph on the right is a demonstration of those individuals who are living below poverty or who would be considered part of an ALICE population. And ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained and, but Employed. So this really is the working poor. And they are one paycheck or two paychecks away from um, really um, impacting over well being for their families or for themselves. Um, you know, they may have to decide whether they want to get groceries or medication or pay, um, pay rent. Um, and as you can see, um, this looks at Connecticut compared to Fairfield County. If you go all the way over to the right hand side, you see Norwalk, uh, the, the, the city of Norwalk, um, 30, 10% are um, below the poverty level, 49% would be considered Alice. So that's a, a large swath of our population that really does have economic constraints that impact their overall well-being. 
I mentioned that um, not all populations um, are equitable in terms of health outcomes. And you can see on the left-hand side in greater Norwalk area, 64% of all Black and African-American residents report uh, being diagnosed with high blood pressure versus 28 of white residents. So again, when you're setting up your clinical programs and outreach into the community, you need to be mindful um, that uh, disease burden is different based on population, different populations. Next slide, please. So based on the community health uh, needs assessment, uh, we generate a community health improvement plan. That, that improvement plan needs to address the top priorities that we identified in the assessment. You have to be very specific about your interventions and programs. And then the programs need to be, um, those objectives need to have performance measures tied to them so that we know um, whether or not we're meeting our desired outcomes. Next slide, please. So when we think about, um, these are just examples um, from our health improvement plan um, based on our needs assessment um, that are underway or taking flight. In terms of health disparities, um, we know that accurately collecting patient demographic data and socioeconomic need is very important as we put together care plans, as we think about the type of care that we're going to deliver, if, it, if we start to risk stratify populations based on these, on these components. Um, very important that it's accurate and it's in the medical record. And then being able to stratify clinical data by these disparities. Again, um, we saw earlier that um, African-American and Black residents report higher levels of high blood pressure. So what we're doing about that, um, in partnership with the American Hospital Association, we're working with our local libraries to put in a hypertension program, education and management, We'll have nurses on site, we'll do education, um, blood pressures, et cetera. Um, also in, in partnership with United Way, because again, these are community programs. So it really is a, a lovely marriage between clinical as well as a community. We are working with an organization called Prosperity. Um, they are uh, a spinoff from United and they are setting up a, an internet or a platform that has programs and services directed specifically at the ALICE population. Because again, this is the working poor, so they don't qualify for programs or subsidies. So this prosperity is an opportunity for businesses, for um, social service agencies, and for philanthropy to be on one site. So we're very excited about this program. And then again, managing the hypertension, having a hypertension task force, that really gets laser focused on the populations that we need to work with. In terms of well being and uh, uh, preventing mental health and substance use disorders, uh, Peter talked about the intensive outpatient adolescent center. Um, it's going to be a, a game changer in our community. Um, in addition to, to those services, we are also increasing psychiatrists and social workers in the outpatient center. We know, especially in Fairfield County, that um, you may have psychiatrists, but they don't take um, insurance, even commercial insurance. So we have a real shortage. So we, we, we definitely need more resources in that arena. And then to continue to provide training to our healthcare and social service agencies around screen, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment for substance misuse. So instead of waiting for somebody to be diagnosed and cared for in an inpatient setting, the more that we can get out in the community, identify when somebody has a substance misuse disorder, we're able to address it sooner before it escalates into something more catastrophic. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Peter, but as you can see, there's a lot of uh, partnerships and a lot of effort really being laser focused on the normal community, so thank you. Thank you, Rorina. Um outstanding work um, being done. And I would right now I would like to uh, introduce Dwight Tarwater from PYA to give his uh, presentation to the community. Dwight, are you there? I'm here. Let me, uh, can you hear me okay? We can. So I think that my colleague David is on there. There he is. David, do you want to Take this first piece right here. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Dwight, and appreciate uh, being able to join just a little bit late, uh, but it's a pleasure to be with everyone here tonight. Uh, Dwight and I have uh, the, the privilege of presenting to you uh, the results from our seventh uh, period 
of um, monitorship. We'll do that tonight. You can see last night we were with the folks at Danbury and then on the 27th of this month, we'll be with the folks at um, Sharon. So what we'd like to do is sort of get through this agenda. Uh, we'll talk about who we are for those who aren't aware of, of you know, what, what does monitor mean? Who are you? Why are you here? We'll talk about this particular uh, review and, and how we got here from a timeline standpoint and what time period is actually being covered. Then we'll get into the findings themselves, uh, talk about next steps, and if there's any, uh, if there are any questions, we'll be prepared to answer those. So uh, quickly, uh, the independent monitor. So oftentimes, when when these sorts of transactions occur, there are various state um, and or federal agencies that review these sorts of things. And in this case, the state of Connecticut had to issue a certificate of need for this change of ownership to occur and New Vance to become the the new sort of parent of these of these hospitals in the system. Um, as a result of that certificate of need process, the um, Office of Health Strategy and the state of Connecticut issued a number of conditions that the new system needed to meet. Um, that was um, known as what's shown there in the third bullet point as a, an agreed settlement. And our job as the independent monitor is to um, look at the, the systems um, um, performance with respect to just those conditions themselves. So we're not looking at everything. We're simply looking at the conditions. Did the system meet the terms of the conditions as outlined in that agreement? It's five-year um, sort of monitorship. Uh, we're into the fourth year now. Uh, we are retained um, by the Office of Health Strategy, uh, but the in this case, New Vance, but in any case, it would be the, um, the affiliated or organizations actually fund the cost of the monitorship. We PYA are a nationwide accounting and consulting firm. Uh, we work, um, our advisory business, our consulting business is almost exclusively in the healthcare industry. We've been around since 83. We work with providers in all 50 states. We ourselves are involved in a lot of transactions such as the one that created New Vance. Uh, our clients include hospitals and health systems, physicians, groups, um, all sorts of providers of virtually every ilk. We also work with, with uh, several healthcare regulatory bodies. So we kind of have the perspective on both sides of a transaction like this, both from the uh, standpoint of what's trying to be accomplished through this transaction, but also um, trying to understand how um, we ensure that the public's interest is maintained through these sorts of monitorships. We've worked with monitors on transactions other than ourselves. And now, uh, and of course, we're, we've served as monitors uh, in transactions. So, um, so this is not new territory for us. Go ahead and turn the, the slide. So um, here are things that, that are, we have a responsibility to do as a result of the agreed settlement. Uh, again, I'm not gonna read to you. Uh, you can read for yourself on this screen, but, but you can see that um, if, if I were to um, characterize all five of these things by sort of one term, it's communication. We have a job to communicate and, and the constituents with whom we have to communicate certainly include the system, certainly include the Office of Health Strategy, uh, but it also includes members of the community, uh, the communities in this case, where the hospitals um, uh, reside. And we've, we've done that now for three years uh, semi-annually with groups, and we've, we've heard from folks. It's to be a part of these public forums and communicate our findings and to take your questions. Um, it's to communicate with the system if we find something to be out of compliance, which thankfully we, we don't have any of that to report tonight. So um, our job is really, you know, the, 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 the name says it all, you know, we're independent and, and we are to monitor but if we don't communicate what we're monitoring, then we've really kind of fallen down on the job. So um, communication is a key component to this. Turning the page. So here's sort of our timeline. Um, I think what's really important here is to understand that the, the period that we're, I mean, it's February, but the period we're actually reporting upon is the period that ended September 30th of 2022. And so there is a there's a, a series of events that have to take place once that period has been completed. And there's a timeline that requires us to be presenting this report to you within you know, the certain criteria that have to be met. So you can see some of those criteria are here on the page. 
Um, but the, the, the important thing is we're talking about April 1st, 22 through September 30th of 22 is really the period that we're reporting upon. Um, and this re our report was submitted within the required timeline to the Office of Health Strategy, and this meeting is occurring within those required timelines. So even the cadence itself is in compliance. Um, so we can answer questions about that before. And let me make one reference. Uh, the PFACs, uh, you see that acronym down there on the sort of the right third of the page. Uh, those are those, those patient advisory groups in each community that we meet with. Uh, so some of you listening tonight may actually be a member of those patient advisory groups with whom Dwight and I had an opportunity to speak. For those of you who don't, there are uh, rosters that the folks at New Vance can make you aware of if you have interest, um, either in speaking with those people or, you know, if there's some process by which you want to express uh, opinions or interest in that. So uh, we, you can see between uh, November 9th and December 16th, we met with all three patient advisory groups for the, the three hospital communities. All right, let's turn the page. So Dwight's gonna kind of take us through the conditions. I wanna note before he gets started that you'll see that uh, each, that um, that is not sequential, meaning that uh, there's not every number between one and 21 covered here. And that means that those conditions that are omitted from this page were not required to be reported upon in the seventh period. Um, so, uh, and the other thing I would say is while this is a kind of a one page summary and we'll give commentary to support it, we, we did as required produce a very comprehensive report that is submitted to the Office of Health Strategy. You can get a copy of that report if that is something you have interest in. Um, that can either be uh, obtained through the Office of Health Strategy or through New Vance. Um, and that gives all of the background um, within that report that we'll be summarizing on this one page here tonight. So please know that that detail is available to you if you want it. Dwight? Thanks, David. And, and as David mentioned, there are those conditions that we are technically reporting on this period. In our report, we've provided a table of those conditions and kind of next steps and timelines associated with those. So, um, so I'll, I'll get going here, as you'll notice. Um, the right column there as yes is all the way down as David mentioned um, we, we didn't find anything that New Vance was not compliant with um, based on this for the seventh period so starting there at the top I'll, I'll just run through you know each of these uh, pretty quickly here Num number one and two kind of go together and it's it's community representation on on each of the hospital's boards um, those boards are decided in January so uh, we will actually be reporting on the new boards for the, for our next period, for our eighth period, which is the, uh, which will, will be probably sometime this summer. Um, the, number three there is, is the, for New Vance to hold two joint, joint board meetings each year. Um, they held one in the summer of 2022 and then one in December of, of 2022. So um, we're able to, to comply with that condition. Um, number, number four is it's calls for New Vance to, to make culturally and linguistically appropriate services available and, and integrated throughout each hospital. Um, in the first period, we did a kind of a deep dive of, of each of the CLAS policies and, and concluded then that New Vance was compliant with, with the terms in the agreed settlement. So we confirmed for this period that those policies are still the same, we'll continue to do so moving forward. So number, number five here is, is to maintain charity care policies um, or adopt new policies that are at least as generous to the community. So this is this one is is twofold here. So we're we're looking at the maintenance of the charity care and as well as the as adhering to those policies. And and um, so that means if New Vance were to adopt the, those new policies, they have to be as generous to the community. So uh, New Vance did adopt a new uh, policy in 2021. We um, helped review that with New Vance, uh, provided our feedback. Um, we we saw that those policies were at least as generous to the community. Um, so th that's the first part of that. The second part of it is here adhering to those charity care policies, and this is this is how those charity care amounts may trend from year to year. So we've reviewed actual historical amounts of charity care for for each of the three hospitals, and we've known that specifically Norwalk has, has increased each year um, since the uh, since the uh, the merger actually took place. Um, David, anything you wanted to add there? Or am I good to, to move forward? 
Well, I may just add one thing for those folks listening. There's a whole lot of misinformation that gets circulated about the term nonprofit. I mean, some folks think that means, hey, you can't, you have to have a zero bottom line or whatever. And that's that's not true. Nonprofit simply means that the, the motive of the organization and the assets of the organization are to serve the community. And so technically speaking, as a nonprofit organization, the community owns the assets. And so the 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 trade-off is okay, if we're not going to tax you on those earnings, then what you're going to do is invest that back into the community. And there are different ways that that happens through you know programs and things of that nature that help the the health of the community, but one of the ways it happens is to ensure that when people present that aren't able to pay for their care, that there's a mechanism by which they have access to the care without being um, burdened by that economic, um, you know, what can be a devastating economic event or turned away and not not provided care. So those policies, um, those charity policies are policies that have a lot of different eyes on them and there are requirements uh, from the federal government about what has to be in that. There are um, certain guidelines that have to be followed. So this isn't just sort of willy-nilly put a policy together. It does have to have um, all of the appropriate boundaries. And we've looked at those to make sure that they do. Um, and as Dwight mentioned, when we say as generous, that has to do with where those thresholds are in terms of uh, individual or household income and how you qualify. Uh, for charity care, which means a portion or all of your um, care can be provided at, at, at differing levels, including no cost. So uh, again, it's one of those things that people talk about often because it's reported upon uh, publicly and the state reports on charity care. But why do we do it? Well, we do it simply because these are community assets and any, any gain that's generated needs to be invested back in the community in some way, shape, or form, and uh, providing care to those who can otherwise not afford it is one of those ways that a nonprofit uh, contributes to its community. So that's why this is important. Moving on to, to number 11 there, independent monitor on-site visits. David, David touched on that earlier. Uh, we completed those in, in November and December uh, 2022. Um, we've got the green box around what we're here to do this evening is the public forums. We met with Danbury last night. Um, we're going to meet with Sharon in uh, a couple weeks. So looking forward to, to further conversations there. Um, number 13, um, we've got co compliance with the terms of price constraints specified in attachment A. And that really is calling for New Vance to show reasonable efforts to promote ongoing alternative payment model contracting and or APMs. And why that is important is because contracting with those APMs gives gives added incentives and in, incentives um, to provide that high quality and cost efficient care, which is you know in which benefits the consumer. Um, so New Vance has shown that they are uh, they're they're actively pursuing those APM models and. Um, with commercial and government payers, so um, we we felt that we felt that uh, New Vance was compliant with with that condition there. For number fifteen, um, and this is there, there's a lot that goes into number fifteen, but we talk we think of cost savings for hospitals um, and report of financial measurement. So um, New Vance is to meet cost savings goals for the fiscal years to 2020, 2021, and 2022. And kind of every six months, New Vance is to, to, to submit these cost saving reports. Those are due at the end of May and the end of uh, November. So um, New Vance submitted their report at the end of November, which took us through 9-30-22, which was actually the end of fiscal year 22. So we had a, a full snapshot at what the cost savings look like for fiscal year 22. And while the the savings were, were, were really impressive, they they fell a little bit short, um, but what that condition does say is that um, if you if we don't meet the if we don't meet those cost savings, we need to we need to provide a reason why. And um, as we all know, that hospitals and health systems across the country are facing um, you know significant expense pressures. So um, we we felt that that um, New Vance's New Vance's response there was was adequate. Um, David, anything on fifteen? Uh, for for the listeners, just to ensure you that um, uh, look when when take business at large, take healthcare out of it. 
when you when you consolidate businesses, you're hopeful that that provides you a more efficient mechanism for providing whatever the good or the service happens to be, and that ultimately the the consumer of that good or service is the benefactor of that because it's provided at a lower cost. Healthcare is tricky because we have to make sure you know when we talk about quality, we're not talking about something breaking. We're talking about people's lives, and so all of that, all those efficiencies have to be viewed through the lens of clinical efficacy and what improves clinical quality. So for the most part, when we think about these types of, of scale, uh, this type of scale and when health systems combine, we're really thinking about a lot of the back office functionality, these are things like how we buy supplies or how we contract with certain vendors where um, the scale provides us with maybe the ability to um, leverage um, more of our own resources or leverage things a little bit more effectively and efficiently. That said, that that cost project, savings projection was produced prior to the actual merger. We're measuring against something now that's you know going on probably five years old. And since it was produced, we've had these sort of two massive events, the pandemic, and then this uh, period of inflation that was higher than um, any period before in the last 40 years. So it's really uh, easy to understand why those cost savings look a little bit different than we thought they might look five years ago or New Vance thought they might look five years ago. But still, there's an accountability to, to what, was, what was projected. And as Dwight mentioned, there have been very impressive savings generated um, year over year as a result of the uh, system coming together. Um, those are the kinds of savings that fund the things you heard talked about earlier in terms of new services uh, that are able to be provided to the, to the community. Um, you know, sometimes that source of fund is internal, but um, but but that sort of helps you understand why um, not necessarily meeting the threshold itself is the be all end all. Understanding what you're trying to do to continue to make certain that those savings accrue to the benefit of the consumers, of which in this case are the residents of the state who are consuming this healthcare, is what's really important. And so that's. Um, that's, that's why we look at it and that's why we pay particular attention to it, despite the fact that circumstances have changed dramatically since that report was, was produced. Um, Dwight, you want me to jump into 16 real quickly? Sure. Um, as, I, as I said before, uh, to use a technical term, 16 is a whopper of a, uh, of a condition and it's broken into several parts. The first of which says, okay, New Vance has to um, produce a strategic plan and are they following that strategic plan and are they executing upon it? And time and again, in these community forums, you've heard um, New Vance report on its strategic plan, but we get reports from them uh, as part of our ongoing monitorship where uh, we, we see what, what's being done with that. And so we feel very confident about what New Vance is doing with respect to executing on its strategic plan. But there are other components on Condition 16 that relate to services that New Vance has to commit to providing um, in an ongoing fashion, or if they are changing certain services that they've provided in the past, that there is documentation associated with that change, that the, the appropriate procedures have been followed um, as it might relate to regulatory oversight with those changes, things of that nature. And so, um, there have been some changes. Um, in fact, um, here in, in Norwalk, as you may have heard earlier when before I joined the call, that as Norwalk has considered how it uh, offers um, behavioral health services, especially from an inpatient perspective, there are some um, changes happening. And we, we're aware of that. We've seen that happen. We followed the appropriate documentation. The documentation has been followed. The state's aware of it. We report on it. And so, um, so, so those things have, have happened appropriately. Um, probably what has maybe garnered a little bit more attention is what's happening over at the Sharon Hospital with respect to some plans associated with their um, OB services and their critical care services. And New Vance has announced their intention to, um, to sunset or, or um, no longer offer those services in the future. They are going through two different certificate of need processes associated with those plans that um, are bearing close attention by the state and many others. We're following that as well. Uh, but as of the date of our report, September 30th, 2022, first of all, 
we can say, and, and New Vance has affirmed, and those affirmations are a part of Condition 16, that those services are being offered, have been offered for the entirety of that period. Um, and we're aware of you know, what's happening with respect to the announcements, and we'll keep an eye on that with the state. We stay in close dialogue with the state on that. We stay in close dialogue with New Vance about those, about those issues. So um, wanted to make sure that folks understand, number one, that, that the services that, that New Vance um, committed to continue offering, we are monitoring uh, that those services are offered or if, they're, if there's going to be a change, that that change follows the appropriate protocol. Um, and, and thus far, we're, we're good with that. Uh, I'll make one notation, and that is that um, in the course of any acute care business, in the course of any business, there can be a suspension of services that could be temporary due to, to facts and circumstances. A lot of health systems have dealt with facts and circumstances associated with adequate staffing um, during and after the pandemic. And one uh, criteria that we've asked New Vance to help us out with is that if any of these services that we're tracking in Condition 16, if they were to incur temporary suspensions uh, due to staffing or some other reason, that we'd be made aware of that as the monitors. Um, there have been a couple of those instances in the past that uh, we were made aware of through community members. We've looked into that. We feel confident that the, the issue was related to an operational matter that, again, uh, in the course of business, those things happen. Um, uh, the services are functioning again. None of that happened, to our knowledge, in the seventh period. Those are periods uh, before the seventh period. So um, for the public that, that, that are listening to this, and as you think about your concern about the, the maintenance of services in your community, these are things we keep a close eye on and that we're um, continuing to monitor appropriately with respect to the conditions and the agreed settlement. So um, everything in 16 turned out good, but if you go to the report, there's a lot of documentation around number 16 that you can, can read for yourself if that's of interest to you. Dwight, you want to pick us back up here with um, 18, which also yes. uh, kind of tags along yeah, we, with the uh, story about OB services? Exactly. I won't repeat uh, what Dave, David said there about the situation at New Vance. The, the condition does ask that um, New Vance maintain that sufficient staffing in that particular service line. We each, each period, we review those rosters and um, can affirm that New Vance is compliant with, with number 18 there. Um, number 19 um, is has been kind of a, an evolving condition. It's act, is actually the first time we've reported on this one, and it and it asks for New Vance's continued participation in in Connecticut's Health Information Exchange, um, which is known as as CONI. And um, what CONI allows providers to do is is We may have had uh, some issues with uh, David and Dwight. Is anyone else still on? I'm still on, John. Yeah, yeah still here, John. Okay. Um, well, let's just give them a moment to see if they can sign back on here. I appreciate everyone's patience. I don't know what happened, but we'll uh, see if they sign back on for us real quick. I think they were fairly close to being finished with their presentation, but um, appreciate everyone's patience. Um, Peter, are you still on? Oh. Hey, John, I'm back. Is everyone else frozen? I locked back in. Okay, you're back. So yeah, it looks like we lost Dwight and David. Most of them <clears throat> are still on, but um, I don't know what happened there. Must have been some sort of. Uh, yeah, I I mean I got out and logged back in, so I'm not sure. Um... Okay. Well, um, well, why don't we wait and see if David and Dwight are able to sign back on? Um, Peter, in the meantime, did you want to turn your camera back on and? Um, Sing. You know, I... I think I've only seen thus far one question, but I will let anyone who's um, 
um, participating tonight um, know that if you do have any questions for Peter or for uh, Dwight and David, um, you can use the Q&A function and uh, you know we would be happy to answer any questions. There is one question, Peter, right now. It's uh, um, they're curious about any if New Vance Health has any walk-in centers located. Oh, wait a second. Here comes David. Hi, David. Hey, sorry, we had a complete. Hey, you know that's that's what happens when you're not meeting face to face and in person. There are glitches every once in a while. It looks like. Uh, well, you know what's interesting? I think it was area wide here. Dwight and Dwight and I are in two different locations. We're probably 25 miles apart, and it hit us both. Um, okay. So it, it hit it hit Peter as well. So a few of us stayed on, but a few of us were knocked off. But luckily, we weren't all knocked off. So. Well, um, I'm on cellular now. I'm off of Wi-Fi. So if, if it glitches a little bit, you guys just interrupt me and let me know. But I think we were right at the end and, and Dwight was talking a little bit about the HIE. We'll be happy to answer questions about that. But for those that are not familiar with a, a health information exchange, um, you know, that is a, 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 manner, a, a, a means by which health data um, about your visit and about you can be uh, accumulated in a warehouse uh, with your permission so that as you go from provider provider, those things are um, available for those providers so that you can, in fact, um, um, take you know, some of that information with you. That is different than an electronic medical record which is actually covered in, uh, as, as part of a number of initiatives. And there's Dwight back on cell phone, I can tell, but a number of initiatives in uh, condition 21 there an electronic medical record is something that's maintained by your provider where all of that information associated with your visits, associated with your health is maintained. The good news is their new Vance is under a lot of requirements to integrate their electronic medical record across the system that has been happening in phases. Uh, I think the last of which uh, occurs this summer sometime. And so um, as, as a resident, your ability to go to any new Vance provider and that, that information follow you which as you know, is, is, is critical to not only patient satisfaction, but um, you know, great clinical outcomes. Also um, uh, just the ability from a care management standpoint, those are, those are key investments that involve tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. But uh, New Vance has um, complied with everything under condition 21 as well uh, related to the EMR. So again, the good news is here were sort of yeses um, across the board. Before we turn the page, Dwight, anything else you want to add uh, to this page before we get to next steps? No, I don't think so. Um, like David mentioned earlier, we've got a ton of detail in our report. It's about 35 pages long. So um, we've got, you know, if you're, if you're interested, um, we're happy to provide that. So thanks. Great. So, John, if you would just turn the page, this will be our last page. Uh, these things um, kind of should, you, you know, what we're doing next. We're already in dialogue with the system, with the state about um, our reporting period number eight. Uh, there are a few additional items we'll be reporting on in period number eight that we're excited to start jumping into and take a look at. But um, uh, once we um, have that information, we'll be um, digging into it, uh, meeting with the public, again, meeting with uh, folks uh, there at New Vance as part of our cadence. Um, and we'll see you again at the next public forum uh, with uh, our period eight report. So with that, John, I think that's our presentation. We're happy to answer the questions as uh, they may come in from the from those participating. Um, but uh, thanks for the time tonight. Fantastic. Um, so again, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, you know, it's uh, um, one thing I will say about this team, and we've done several of these forums together, is we're always very agile and able to uh, deal with glitches. Um, thanks for Dwight for signing on with his uh, cell phone and for everybody coming back on who froze. And we appreciate you being patient with us. So we do have one question. If anybody else has any other questions, you know, please uh, let us know. Um, you know, you you're free to type them into the Q&A section or the chat. But Peter, the one question we do have is, um, someone who's curious if we have any walk-in centers uh, if, and where they are and, and do people have to make appointments if they um, go to a walk-in center? Sure, John. And, in, um, you know, Dwight and uh, David mentioned a strategy as part of the evaluation. So no one, no one better to answer this as someone who spearheaded this than our chief strategy officer, Gene Ahn, who's, who's on the call. So Gene, if you wouldn't mind uh, responding. Sure. 
Um, I'm not sure that I can get myself off uh, on camera. Uh, block. I will, looks like. I, will, I will try to get you on camera, Jean. It's probably right, yeah, I probably turned you off. So just one second. I. There you go. Now you should be able to. Um... Sure. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the good question. Uh, we are excited that we will be announcing shortly um, the uh, our launching of our urgent care centers to serve the patients in our communities, um, starting with Norwalk, the Norwalk community. So that will be coming very shortly. And to answer the question, um, no appointment will be needed to utilize these urgent care centers. So that same great quality that you receive from Norwalk Hospital and New Vance Health, you will be getting from these urgent care sites as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. So I don't know, Peter, if you wanted to uh, share any parting thoughts, um, you know, and sure. uh, okay. So one, I want to thank, thank everyone. Uh, thank OHS, thank PYA, thank the community. And um, from the Norwalk community, I think it's very exciting to see what's been happening in our community for the past few years uh, as we've been part of a larger system, New Vance, you see the growth, you see the achievements, and uh, I look forward to growing together with you and um, to look forward to the next community forum and stay tuned, not just for these forums, stay tuned for some of the um, outreach that we'll have uh, in the future and in the upcoming months about other initiatives that we have moving forward and we will keep you apprised of uh, our progress in, in all of these initiatives um, for you, our community and the patients we serve. So thank you and um, good night. All right, thank you so much, Peter. And just a uh, final piece of housekeeping, uh, the, this video, we have recorded this, so this will be posted on our website. And uh, if you have any questions after the fact, you, know, you can always email us um, you know, or, or reach out to us uh, via social media or anything like that. We'd be happy to um, have a conversation with you. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night.